Hello everyone. Uh, today we are going to have the second part of the blood biochemistry and mainly today we will focus on hemoglobin basically. We will learn about the structures of hemoglobin, their properties, the uh, clinical scenarios that can arise because of abnormal hemoglobin, certain diseases. We will learn about them in details. So let's begin. Now we have learned from the previous lecture the hemoglobin is the most abundant porphyrin containing compound. If you remember porphyrin uh, in the last chapter or the last class we have learned about it. So, ba so basically our hemoglobin is the most abundant porphyrin containing compound and it's made up of four subunits which gives us, give its a tetramer structure. Four subunits together combined to form the structure of hemoglobin and each of these subunits will have this hem group that we have discussed previously and will also have a polypeptide change. So the structure of hemoglobin will look somewhat like this. If you can see here in this diagram it will have four subunits and in the center of these subunits if you can see here we have our hem group attached to the iron and each of these subunits will also have the polypeptide change all of these subunits will have it. Now, the polypeptide chains which we have in the hemoglobin are five kinds, basically. We have alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon. In total, there can be five kind of polypeptide chain. The alpha chain is made up of 141 amino acids. The rest that we have beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon chains are made up of 146 amino acids. So you can see here there is a big difference among the polypeptide chain. The alpha chain will have fewer amino acids compared to the other chain. The gene for this polypeptide chain of hemoglobin are also known as globulin genes, as you can see here. The genes that will code for this polypeptide chain. Now, these genes are found in clusters of two different chromosomes. The alpha cluster is present on chromosome 16 and the beta cluster is found on chromosome 11. Okay, so it's important you should know that in which chromosome number we'll find the gene that codes for this polypeptide. Okay, so keep in mind that the alpha cluster will be found in the chromosome number 16, whereas the beta cluster will be found in the chromosome number 11. We know that hemoglobin synthesis occurs in the red blood cells, basically. As a precursor, the synthesis of the hemoglobin will take place in the red blood cells. It begins in pro-erythroblast stage of the red blood cells. And when the red blood cells reaches the erythroblast stage, 65% of the hemoglobin synthesis is already completed. The remaining portion will be completed at the reticulocyte stage of the RBCs. Now part of the synthesis of the hemoglobin also will take place in the mitochondria. See here the hem group part of it will also take place in the mitochondria. Now the synthesis will stop when the mitochondria will disappear from the red blood cells. We know that in a matured red blood cells we don't have any mitochondria but in pre-stages that is erythroblastic stages and reticulocytic stages okay during that time mitochondria can be present. The globin protein part of the hemoglobin are synthesized on ribosome located in the cytoplasm. The whole process of synthesis of hemoglobin and globin are synchronized so they will take place in a synchronized matter. The alpha 2 beta 2 hemoglobin chain that is found usually represents the adult hemoglobin also denoted by HB capital A. In a normal adult majority portion of the hemoglobin will be of this kind will have two alpha chain and two beta chain. A minute portion of the hemoglobin will be in the form of AB uh, sorry HbA2 that is two alpha chain and two delta chain. Okay, but majority portion will be having the HP capital A. The alpha 2 epsilon 2 form of the hemoglobin is known as embryonic hemoglobin. 
the alpha 2 gamma 2 form is known as fetal hemoglobin or also we call it hbf in fetus this is the major type of hemoglobin that you will find but in some adults you can also find fetal hemoglobin but in a very minute amount so in summary the whole structure of hemoglobin if you consider will be mainly having a secondary structure in the global chain that is alpha helix if we have learned the structure of protein you know that there are several stages primary secondary tertiary and quaternary okay so the major secondary structure that we will find in hemoglobin is our alpha helix structure in beta gamma delta and epsilon change there will be eight alpha helical region and they will be named as from a to h in alpha chain however you will find seven helices instead of eight the helix d will be missing in cases of the alpha chain uh, in cases of alpha chain we will not have uh, the d zone that we are talking about okay in case of beta gamma delta and epsilon we will have a b c d e f g h total eight zones okay of alpha helices however for alpha chain of the hemoglobins we'll only have seven so the structure will look somewhat like this as you can see here a b c d e f g h in total eight helices will be found in a typical hemoglobin structure which is of beta gamma delta and epsilon if it's alpha chain we won't have this zone the d zone will be missing in that cases in the center of each hemoglobin or a hem group we'll find a ferrous ion the ferrous ion will have six electrons in its outermost part and among those six four of them will link the iron to the four nitrogen of the heme group so usually hemoglobin will exist in two form basically in a normal thermodynamic conformation hemoglobin will exist in two form the two form are known as t for tense and r for relax when oxygen binds to the hemoglobin we know that hemoglobin's main function is to carry oxygen right you all know this so when the oxygen binds to the hemoglobin it becomes relaxed the hemoglobin changes its shape into a relaxed state from the tense state so during this process during the from converting from tense state to relaxed state what will happen you'll see a pair of alpha and beta subunit would rotate by 15 degree and the gap in between these two beta polyheptide chain will become narrower when oxygen will attaches to the iron so there will be fewer gaps in between them now this process of oxygen binding to the hemoglobin is regulated by an important regulator we call this regulator 2,3 by phosphoglycerate in short we call it 2,3 BPG and it's a very important regulator because it regulates the oxygenation and deoxygenation of hemoglobin this 2,3 by phosphoglycerate will be formed in the erythrocyte at first as 1,3 by phosphoglycerate and if you have studied the uh, carbohydrate metabolism you have seen that it's an intermediate of glycolysis 1,3 by phosphoglycerate so and hemoglobin as you can see here having four subunits for example this one is having two alpha chain and two beta chain but in the center you can see they have a hollow like space this is where we have the ferrous ion and this is where the oxygen will ultimately bind when binding takes place the hemoglobin will change its shape by rotating the alpha and beta chain to 15 degree thereby will change from a tense state to a relaxed state now when we have a very high concentration of 2,3 BPG or biphosphoglycerate what will happen this 2,3 biphosphoglycerate will come and bind to the central cavity now what happens if 2,3 BPG binds to the central uh, uh, central cavity 
So when the 2,3 BPG will bind to the central cavity, it will do the reverse what oxygen do. It will change the hemoglobin from relaxed state to tense state. And as it happens, it will release the oxygen from hemoglobin. So at first, what is happening? When oxygen binds to the hemoglobin in the central cavity, its conformation is changed from tense state to relaxed state. But if the body needs oxygen now, because oxygen, if my body will need oxygen, we'll need to extract it from the hemoglobin. So hemoglobin needs to release this oxygen, right? So in order to that, do that, what happens when we have a very high level of 2,3 biphosphodesiderate, it will bind to this central cavity and thereby it will change the hemoglobin conformation from relaxed state to tense state. So there will be changes in shape. As a result, oxygen will be released. Now, these 2,3 BPG usually will bind to the beta chains by salt bonds or ionic bonds. And it will help in the release of oxygen from hemoglobin. How? By converting the hemoglobin to T form, from R form. So when our body needs oxygen, there will be more conversion of 1,3 biphosphoglycerate into 2,3 biphosphoglycerate. This will allow the 2,3 BPG to bind to the central cavity and hence help us to release the oxygen. Just the opposite will take place when we have a very high amount of oxygen. If we have high amount of oxygen, okay, oxygen will bind to the central cavity of hemoglobin, change it from T to R form, and thereby will make the gap narrower between the beta chain. And if the gap becomes narrower, okay, there will be no space for our 2,3 biphosphoglycerate to bind. Okay, so we don't need to release oxygen because we already have a higher oxygen availability. So we would not need to release the oxygen anymore. Okay, so this is how basically the oxygenation and deoxygenation of the hemoglobin process are regulated. There is one more important thing we should know about the, uh, this process of uh, binding is that it takes place by the mechanism of something known as cooperative binding. So we know that there are four subunits of uh, hemoglobin. Now each one of these subunits will bind to one oxygen molecule. So one hemoglobin molecule can bind to four oxygen molecules. Okay, so when the four oxygen molecule binds to the hemoglobin, it looks something like this, as you can see here, when it's binding to the hem group. Now binding of one oxygen molecule will facilitate or encourage the binding of oxygen to the another oxygen molecule. So this, this uh, facilitation that is binding once one oxygen atoms bind, it facilitates the binding of another. And the, as it happens, this is known as cooperative. That is, they will cooperate with one another that is encourage one another to bind. Okay, so you'll see the binding of the one oxygen molecules to hemoglobin will facilitate the binding of the another oxygen molecule and this is known as cooperative binding and this is the reason why we have a sigmoidal curve when you check oxygen dissociation curve if you have learned already in physiology you'll see that oxygen dissociation curve is in a sigmoid shape something more like an s that is because of this ox cooperative binding of the oxygen atom okay so something like this the cooperative binding is not shown by myoglobin however we have learned from the previous class that myoglobin is a monomer. Oxygenated myoglobin will only release oxygen only when oxygen tension is very low. So the sigma in oxygen dissociation curve, the myoglobin will not show the sigmoidal shape. It will look something like this as you see here. However, hemoglobin will have more an S-like shape, sigmoidal shape. Okay, now our hemoglobin have several derivatives. That is, it can form several derivatives. It includes oxyhemoglobin, carboxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, and sulfur hemoglobin. 
first one oxygen globin is you already know is the oxygenated form of the globin it's bright red in color and it's transported to tissue in the form of oxygen hemoglobin next one carboxyhemoglobin it will combine with carbon monoxide and as it combine it forms carboxyhemoglobin the affinity of the hemoglobin for carbon is much higher than that for oxygen so carbon c hemoglobin will you will see cherry red in color you'll see if anybody is poisoned with carbon monoxide if somebody is stuck in a air tight room and if there is carbon monoxide ga gas released and the patients who are been poisoned with carbon monoxide you'll also see that their skin their face are turning into cherry red color because of this because of why because carboxyhemoglobin is cherry red in color now the structure of carboxyhemoglobin is much more stable compared to our oxyhemoglobin now once we have uh, uh, once the carboxyhemoglobin is formed that is when carbon monoxide have bound to the hemoglobin once it will be become very difficult to separate them and as carboxyhemoglobin is formed this will also decrease our body's or blood's ability to carry oxygen the next derivative is methemoglobin there are certain drugs and chemicals that can oxidize the ferrous ion of hemoglobin to ferric ion drugs such as sulfonamides such as nitrites they can very easily cause the oxidation and ultimately convert the hemoglobin into methemoglobin now methemoglobin will have a brownish red color some methemoglobin can be formed inside the body by our normal physiological process that takes place but that is very minute amount our rbcs have enzymes called methemoglobin reductase and glutathione so even if there is methemoglobin formed in the body by physiological processes they will be reduced immediately into hemoglobin and our rbc will be capable of doing so because the amount will be very very minimal now the methemoglobin unlike our oxyhemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin they cannot bind to oxygen but they can bind with something called cyanide and if they bind with cyanide they will form something called cyan methemoglobin okay so that's why if we have any patient who have been poisoned with cyanide we can use methemoglobin uh, or this property feature to treat those patients as methemoglobin can bind with cyanide okay so it can be treated that way let's see how it is done if the patient comes with the signs and symptoms of cyanide poisoning the patient at first is giving something known as sodium nitrite and sodium thiosulfate sodium nitrite has the ability we have just seen to convert hemoglobin into methemoglobin now methemoglobin will bind with cyanide to form cyanomethemoglobin which is less toxic and the sodium thiosulfate that we are giving this will react with cyanide to form something called sodium thiocyanate in this way we can reduce the toxic effect of the cyanide poisoning the fourth derivative is called sulfa hemoglobin now sulfa hemoglobin okay this is basically what this is also sulfonamides and h2s sulfa hemoglobin okay uh, sorry hydrogen sulfide can convert the hemoglobin into sulfur hemoglobin they will have a dirty brown color and also just like the previous one meth hemoglobin they cannot bind with the oxygen but they will persist in the red blood cells throughout the lifespan of the rbcs so these are some derivatives now let's check out some abnormal hemoglobins now abnormal hemoglobin can be formed as a result of mutation of the gene which gene the globulin gene most commonly a single amino acid is affected and substituted in this mutation there are hundreds of mutant hemoglobins which have been uh, discovered most of these mutant hemoglobin can function normally or near normally if they can function normally or near normally we'll call this hemoglobin variant hemoglobin okay we will not call them abnormal hemoglobin 
but we'll call them hemoglobin variant. Why? Because they still can function either 100% or near 100%. That's why we're calling them variant hemoglobin. Okay. Now, in those cases where the mutation have resulted in impairment of the function of hemoglobin, maybe because the mutation have taken place in an important amino acids, and if the hemoglobin have lost its functioning ability, then only we'll call it abnormal hemoglobin. You see, in some mutation, it can take place in critical region, so this may impair the hemoglobin function. And if such happens, we're calling them abnormal hemoglobin. And if any disease develops because of this abnormal hemoglobins, we'll call them hemoglobinopathies, that is diseases of the hemoglobin. Okay, some of the examples of hemoglobinopathies includes hemoglobin S, hemoglobin M, and thalassemia. Now we will learn about these hemoglobinopathies in details one by one. Okay, the first one, hemoglobin S. Okay, now this hemoglobin S will be formed when we have, see here, glutamate residue at position 6 in the beta chain when it's replaced by valine so this amino acid is replaced by valine amino acids then it will result in the formation of hemoglobin s now glutamate the amino acid is a polar one it has a polar side chain the valine however is a non-polar amino acids okay so if such replacement is taking place it will change the properties of the hemoglobin because at, in a normal hemoglobin it had a polar one in the outer surface but now it has been replaced by a non-polar one and as a result of these changes the hemoglobin will now attract one another that is the other portion maybe one hemoglobin is abnormal but other there will be several hemoglobin that will be normal so they will attract one another and if such attraction takes place it will lead in aggregation of hemoglobin molecules because now they will be attached to one another they will clump with one another okay so they will bind with one another clump with one another which is not good so they will look something like they are binding with one another aggregated hemoglobin molecule usually in normal condition there is no aggregation of hemoglobin molecule now, if hemoglobin aggregation takes place, this will result in the formation of a fibrous structure. And this will also result in changes in the shape of the RBCs. So, if you remember, it's called HBS, right? So, the RBCs will change into sickle shape. The S stands for sickle shape. So, because of the aggregation, the RBC structure are being distorted and they will look something like this. If you already know, a normal RBC will be biconcave, right? But in HBS, hemoglobinopathy or sickle cell diseases, we will have a sickle shaped RBCs. You can see the difference between a normal and a sickle cell RBC in this image over here. We know or we have already studied that when oxygen binds with hemoglobin, they are in a relaxed state, if you remember. Now, when we have such mutation which has resulted in substitutes of glutamine by valine, the relaxed state, okay, you'll see here, non-polar valine residues are not exposed on the surface in relaxed states. Okay, so therefore, there will be no more aggregation. So what is the point here? If the hemoglobin is in deoxygenated form, it will promote aggregation. However, if they are in oxygenated state, that is their relaxed state, the non-polar portion of the valine is no more exposed outside. So if it's not anymore exposed, it will not attract other hemoglobin and will not cause aggregation. Okay, but deoxidated, if the hemoglobin is in deoxidated state, they will enhance the aggregation. Okay, so in oxidated form, there will be no more aggregation in hemoglobin 
if the patient have sufficient amount of oxygen and hemoglobin. However, in deoxidated form, we know that the hemoglobin will be in 10 state, T. So the non-polar side of the valine will be exposed to outside. So they will attract hemoglobin and will promote aggregation. Now, hemoglobin will be present in deoxidated form when oxygen tension is low. So there will be aggregation of hemoglobin S molecules and sickling of the RBCs if the patient does not have sufficient amount of oxygen. Okay. Now if such happens, if there is aggregation, then there can be many problems here. One, as you can see in this image, they can block the blood flow. So all hemoglobin are causing the RBCs to turn into sickle shape and therefore they will interfere with the normal blood flow as well. Okay, due to why? Due to abnormal hemoglobin. One more important thing is that the sickle RBCs can get destroyed early, premature destruction. Maybe they will not complete their 120 days lifespan. They will destroy early and may result in anemia. Okay, so these are the problems that can happen because of hemoglobinopathy such as HBS. The same hemoglobinopathy is our hemoglobin M or also known as Boston hemoglobin. Now this one happens due to mutation where there is replacement of histone 58 in the alpha chain. So this amino acid is replaced by tyrosine. Now phenol group of tyrosine will bind with the iron and as it binds with the iron it converts the ferrous ion into ferric ion. We know the conversion of ferrous ion to ferric ion leads to something known as meth hemoglobin and we also learn that meth hemoglobin cannot combine with oxygen. So patients who have such M hemoglobin okay, or Boston hemoglobin and they will maybe suffer from low oxygen tension. Third and the last one is thalassemia. Now thalassemia will result may mainly due to decrease lack or synthesis, lack of synthesis of either alpha or beta chain. It can also happen due to defective synthesis of alpha chain. If alpha chain is defective, we will call it alpha thalassemia and if beta chain is defected, we will call them beta thalassemia. Now, if one type of chain, if there is a lack of synthesis of one type of chain, okay, this will cause overproduction of the other type. Let's say we have defective alpha chain, so it cannot be synthesized properly, so we will have excessive beta chain production. Now this will cause either a hemoglobin having only alpha chain or only beta chain. Okay, so one of them will be overproduced, other will have lack of production. Okay, next content is porphyria, another clinical aspect of the blood biochemistry lecture. We have already learned what is porphyria, porphyrin and so on. Now porphyria, okay, not porphyrin, okay, porphyria is a group of disorder. Now mainly these disorder are due to mainly any abnormalities or defects in the synthetic pathway of porphyrin, basically. Now if anybody is suffering from porphyria, there will be large quantities of the porphyrins or their intermediates found in the urine. So mainly they will have a defect in the synthetic pathway and because of that there will be excess amount of porphyrin found in the urine. So mostly it happens because of a defective enzyme. Okay, in the synthetic pathway if we have a defective enzyme or absent of the enzyme, this can lead to porphyria. As a result of lack of enzyme or defect of enzyme, there will be intermediates formed. The, in the synthetic pathway. Now, these urine in normal in color when fresh, but if you expose the urine of these patients of porphyria onto light, the urine will turn pink. 
mainly due to oxidation process. In the presence of light, there will be oxidation of porphyrogenes. Patients who have porphyria also have skin sensitivity. When their, their skin is exposed to light, they also develop skin problems. The intermediates, as we have just seen, are the reason why these symptoms are appearing. Because there is no enzyme, so, so there will be accumulation of intermediates. If the intermediates are in early phase of synthetic pathway, they will cause more problem or more severity compared to late intermediates, which are produced in the late, late stages of synthetic pathway. Because why? Because early intermediates are known to cause or damage to the nervous tissues. So they will have neuropsychiatric abnormalities. So for these porphyrias, the defective gene is basically found into a particular type of tissues. They will mainly cause expression in a particular tissues. And depending on their site of expression, we have two kinds of porphyrias. Hepatic porphyrias and erythropoietic porphyrias. Hepatic porphyrias have again subtypes. We have acute intermittent porphyria, porphyria cutina tarda, hereditary porphyria, variegate porphyria. Second one, erythropoietic have two subtypes, congenital erythropoietic porphyria and protoporphyria. Now let's check out each one of these. So under hepatic porphyria, the first one is acute intermittent porphyria. They are basically inherited in an autosomal dominant manner. The enzyme which have the defect is usually uroporphyrogen 1 synthetase and the site of expression is liver cells. Second one, porphyria cutina tarda, autosomal dominant again. Enzyme that is involved is uroporphyrogen decarboxylase, site of expression is liver cells. The third one, hereditary coproporphyria. Again, autosomal dominant enzyme is coproporphyrogen oxidase. Expression is liver cells. Fourth one is variegate coproporphyria. Autosomal dominant enzyme is protoporphyrogen oxidase. Expression is liver cells. Now, under the electro, we have First one, congenital erythropoietic porphyria. See the difference? It's autosomal recessive. Enzyme involved is uroporphyrogen 3 cosynthetase. Site of expression is erythroid cells. Second one is protoporphyria, autosomal dominant. The enzyme involved is ferrogelitase, also known as hem oxygenase. Site of expression is liver cells. Now, in porphyria, the main signs and symptoms includes neurovisceral. If it's hepatic porphyria, it will mainly include, you see here, neurovisceral. In cases of erythropoietic porphyrias, it will mainly involve cutinous, means skin. But there can be overlapping of symptoms in between these two types. Okay, so usually hepatic porphyria patients will have acute attacks of abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, okay, in cases of, in some cases they can have overactive sympathetic nervous system, so they may have tachycardia, very fast heartbeat, tremors, as well as hypertension. In some patients, they may also experience anxiety, insomnia, disorientation, depression, muscular weakness, and even seizure can happen. So mainly in cases of hepatic porphyria, the signs and symptoms include neurovisceral. Okay, so neurological sign and visceral sign mainly. In cases of erythropoietic, we have learned that cutinous photosensitivity can be a feature. Okay, and as we have seen that there can be overlapping of symptoms, so you may find cutinous photosensitivity also in hepatic porphyria, especially in hereditary coproporphyria, variegate porphyria, and porphyria cutina tarda. You may have this uh, skin manifestation as well. Now, the second kind, erythropoietic porphyria. In these cases, mainly they will have severe skin photosensitivity. 
So when their skin is exposed to light or sunlight, skin will be damaged. There will be vesicles formed on the skins which will erupt. Skin will become very fragile and pigmented. There will be areas in the skin which will have denuded. They will be more prone to infections. Some patients may also have bones and teeth involvement which will be pigmented mainly due to deposition of porphyrin precursor. There can be destruction of blood cells due to binding of porphyrin to hemoglobin okay and liver damages can also take place even though liver dam liver is the site of expression for hepatic porphyria but we have seen that these signs and symptoms can overlap in between them so basically the ketonous manifestation will be formed when the patients will skin will be exposed to light for neurovisceral symptoms, they can be precipitated by steroids, alcohol, and drugs. So if some people is taking alcohol, steroids, drugs, okay, and if they have the history of hepatic porphyria, they will develop the symptoms. The drugs that can initiate such actions will include barbiturates, cardamazepine, and so on. These drugs can cause the initiation of these symptoms. Okay, so these are the two types of Porphyrias. So from this lecture, please do know the structures of the hemoglobin in detail. Okay, the subunits, the chains that we have. Okay, the important thing. Uh, know about the uh, how the two status of the hemoglobin, the R status and the T status. So which one will bind to oxygen? How it changes? Okay, and allows the oxygen to be released. Know about cooperative binding important thing is about derivatives of this hemoglobin okay abnormal hemoglobin is the kind that we have learned today hemoglobin s hemoglobin m and thalassemia knows what is the problem in these abnormal hemoglobins okay and these hemoglobinopathies and lastly know about the porphyrias that two kind that we have hepatic porphyria and erythropoietic porphyria so that's all for today's lecture and with this we have completed our blood biochemistry and we'll continue the course in the next class thank you